Thank you, Bubba. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Good morning, church. I'm thankful that you guys are here this morning. And um, I'm telling you, there was such um, an anticipation to come and be in the presence of God. And I hope you guys felt that. Do you feel that this morning, this morning, church? It's been um, an amazing day. Thank you, worship team. I know everybody stepped off, but my appreciation to everybody, the worship team, you guys in the Thank you. There's Gina and Jaden and Carson. And thank you guys. Um, for leading us into a powerful, powerful presence and, and worship time. Can we give our appreciation to our worship team this morning? Thank you, guys. I'm very grateful for what this weekend represents. It is, um, it is so much more than, than hot dogs and hamburgers. Um, this, I'm always in awe of this weekend. I really am. And I'm, I'm saying this with so much fear and trembling, but I'm so grateful to live in this country that we live in. Um, very, very grateful. And if you, um, I'm hoping and praying that you have a biblical worldview and you think outside of just Longview, Texas. But um, um, when you ever do get to travel outside of, of the 903 area code, I'm telling you, church, um, even outside of the country, we, we live in, in an incredible country. It might not look like it right now, and it's getting torn to pieces, but um, it's still a great nation. And a lot of men and women fought for us to have this freedom. And we get to celebrate this freedom this weekend. Amen, church? And I hope you took time to celebrate that. But also, as believers, there's always something else to that freedom. Amen, church? I'm thankful for the freedom we have in this country. I'm thankful because I've been in countries where that freedom wasn't there to walk into a church and have that kind of freedom. Um, and that, that was bought and paid for by men and women. And so I hope you thank somebody that have served. I know we've got some here this morning. I, I do, I'm grateful for those who have served. My dad has served. My brother served. And we've got my best friend, JP, has served. Um, but thank you guys very much for all that. But also the freedom that we have um, that Jesus has given us. Yeah. Uh, I'm sitting here this morning just very grateful for the freedom that I find in him. And... Um, and if you've ever been bound and just broken, and I think that covers a lot of people, um, when you feel such a sense of freedom, you, 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 um, you don't take that for granted. You say, amen, church. So thank, thank you guys for being here. Happy 4th of July to you. And um, may you continue to celebrate that the only way you know how. But let's, let's be grateful for the, for the nation we live in, church. I really am. And so thank those who have um, paid the price for us. We're going to get right into God's Word. I, I like where um, it's so appropriate where the Holy Spirit has been bringing us as a church. And I'm going to be standing here for, for those of you in the balcony. If you have trouble seeing, you might want to step down maybe a little bit to help you guys out in case you can't see me. I'm sorry, guys. I know there's a couple up there, but I can't see because of the lights. But if you're up there, I love you. Uh, I know you paid a lot of money to sit in those seats, but I, well, if you want to come down and uh, maybe sit a little bit closer, you can see me in case you can't. Um, Last week, we started a, a sermon series titled Guardrails, and, um, there's <laughs> and um, Stay in Your Lane, really, is what, what this has been titled. Stay in Your Lane. Can you say, Stay in Your Lane? Uh, I know there's been a lot of that vocalized on, on so many platforms and verbally, and I've, I, it's just it's so appropriate where we are right now in Stay in Your Lane, um, but the... The topic really that we're getting to talk about is guardrails. And when it comes down to it, it's the Holy Spirit that puts up these guardrails in our lives. Now, on a highway, you have guardrails. And if you do any amount of driving, and especially with those of you who are student drivers and just now knew all this, um, the guardrails, it, it, when it comes down to it, here's the definition, if you will. It's a system that's designed to keep you um, off or away from dangerous areas. 
Um, the point of guardrails, really, when we established this last week, is to light up your conscience, um, both physically but also spiritually, that there's danger there. Um, hopefully you see that before you even get to the point to where you might run into it or hit it. And even if you do, the damage that's caused by that is so much more less than if those things were not there to begin with. You still with me, church? Even spiritually speaking, um, and here's the heart behind this. This is not just some gimmicky sermon series that the Holy Spirit's kind of got us in, folks. There, there is a purging that's happening right now. I've, I've, been, I've, I've been specifically spoken three prophetic words just this week alone. Um, and in those words, although the details in those words uh, addresses different areas and different things, whether personally or the church, or uh, uh, the details on that they were a little bit different. But there was one common thread in every single one of those prophetic words is it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and as Christians, as believers, we ought to be seeking God without all of our hearts and getting as close as we can. Folks, let me just put it to you plain and simple. The time to play games and play church are over. It really is time for us to really get serious as to where do you stand in your relationship with the Lord. And that's only a question that you can answer. I can't answer that for you. I can preach until I'm actually uh, blue in the face, blue in this coat I'm wearing. I, I, I can't preach you into heaven. No one can preach you into heaven. No one can. I mean, it, it doesn't work that way. It is an individual. And this is what I love about the God that we serve. It, 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 he's my God. He, I'm his favorite. You're his favorite. It is a personal relationship that I have with him. And I have been doing inventory in my own self as to what does my walk look like? What does that look like for me, God? I want you to expose the very crevices and, 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 and those dark places. Bring that, expose that, because I want to be as close as I can. Folks, I'm telling you, titles don't buy you heaven. It doesn't get you that. It doesn't work like that. And so I, that's the heart behind where this is going. And um, so I wanted to go and set that up before we go any further, that guardrails are so important in our lives. And um, today I want to talk about moral guardrails. I know it's going to be a very, very tough topic on a 4th of July weekend. Um, but I'm telling you folks, now you understand the heart behind where we're going on this. You'll understand wh why the Holy Spirit's taken us to this particular topic and even this direction on 4th of July. And here's the truth behind all this. Actually, if we were to just, just capture and understand and really focus on this one thing. And I'll preach that one thing here in a minute. We'll get to it. If we can just get that right, it can literally change the culture that we live in right now. It's that huge. And you'll understand that when we get to it. Um, let me give you some, some biblical reference and where we're going in our text. If you guys have your word, your swords, turn into 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Amen. And as you guys are turning there, a um, little over 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul, um, as you guys know, and if you have one of those Bibles that has the maps on the back, those are really awesome, by the way. Um, if you um, look in that, you'll see the missionary journeys that Paul took in planting churches. And um, he planted churches all over the Mediterranean basin. And so if you do any kind of geography and kind of get your, your bearings on where that is in our day and time today, um, you'll know where the areas are that he planted churches. And so he went around three times, took people with him at times, and, um, and this is why they're called missionary works, because he went around planting these churches, and he would pull up in the city and just establish the Lord's work and really made all about him to make his name famous. Amen, church? And so in this particular topic, or where we're going today in our text, is Corinth. He wrote a particular letter to Corinth, because after he would establish these churches and plant these churches, in order for him to have contact with these churches, he would write them letters, and, and Corinth... The, the church in Corinth, and this was where we get the Corinthians letters from, um, were having some very difficult issues within their church. 
They were starting to stray away, um, do certain things that were not of God. And so he, this came back to Paul. He got kind of caught wind of it and wrote some letters to be able to bring instructions to the leaders of this church to bring the people back to point zero and walk in, in a relationship with Jesus. You still follow me, church? So this is where you get the Corinthian church and, and, and Corinthian letters. And in fact, if you really read this, similar to James, there's some harshness that comes across in Paul's words. If you really read it, you can almost feel it and almost feel a little bit of sense of frustration and not anger of some of the things that were happening within the church. So he's addressing Christians, but also this letter applies to those who are non-Christians. But he's addressing people in the church and addressing some of the problems that have been arising within the church body. Uh, in fact, when you, that's why you get to, and when you get to the love chapter in chapter 13, that's why the love chapter is there because there was so much anger and frustrations, not at people. Remember, the anger is at sin. And so he comes across, he says, well, I know how to combat that. I'll, I'll even support that with some love. And so that's where you get the love chapter from. So I wanted to kind of give you a little context of what time when you get to chapter 6, you know what's going on there. So you understand why he says what he says here. And like, again, this is going to be a very deep topic today, but it's so much needed. And um, well, you'll see where we're going. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'll start in verse 18. And we're just going to go and go verse by verse and um, talk about those. And then we'll get into some practical things I want to leave you with before we celebrate communion around this table. And it starts in verse 18, and it says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Let's stop and pray. God in heaven, thank you for this moment that we have together, God. There is a reason, a purpose that you are taking us to this direction here this morning, God. I'm listening. I'm listening, Lord. This world needs purity. This world needs people who are going to be walking in righteousness, Lord, because they're watching God. Lord, there's still so much work to be done. And so, Father, may you speak to hearts and lives. Open them up right now. Anoint ears and hearts and minds to listen, to hear, to apply, Lord, the, the word that you have for me, for us. So speak Holy Spirit right now. We ask this in your name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 This particular sin, and in my notes I actually called it this sin, but se sexual immorality um, there's Paul, what he's trying to get at in this particular topic is he puts this particular sin in a category of his own. Now, please don't confuse. I'm not, uh, I haven't lost my theological mind, but stay with me, okay? Um, nowhere does he say that this particular sin is worse than the other sins, so stay with me. That's not what Paul's saying, but Paul put this in another category for this reason alone. The consequences and the recovery from this particular sin are severe. Are you, are you with me here today, church? Okay, I understand this is a very heavy topic, but stay with me. This is so appropriate to where we are today. The reason he sets this apart, he says these are sins outside the body, but this particular sin is in. There's a reason for that. And, he, and like I said, the consequences to that are so, so much different. Now, some of the questions, I've even got this question before, because I'm coming thinking, okay, in this topic, when I've talked to people before, what are the questions I've gotten? And the number one question I've gotten is, are they forgivable? Are, is this type of sin forgivable in place? I, I want you to make sure you hear this if you hear anything. A thousand times yes is very forgivable. Amen, church? I am so grateful that all sins are forgivable when it comes to this especially. Yes, it's forgivable, but as I mentioned, it's a little bit different. And let me kind of qualify it a little bit. Sins, when it comes to academic or professional, um, financial, if, if you mess up in any of those areas, it's a little easier to, to recover financially, isn't it, if you make a mistake. 
It's a little bit easier to say to grief, even relationally when it comes to friendship. And I talked about that last week. If we were to somehow mess up in that area and stumble and fall a little easier. But when it comes to this, it's a little bit harder. The consequence, and this is what I mean by, this is what Paul's saying. The recovery and the, and the consequences behind this, it's, it, it goes so much deeper. In fact, he would even go to say, and this is a whole other topic, and I mean, the Lord's really bringing me to this particular topic for some reason, and we're going to address it in the sermon series coming up, but it's generational. I've talked about that in the last few weeks, and it's such a burden on my heart as far as generational curses and generational blessings. This affects you, of course, you and the other person, and it can affect intimacy later, but it also could be generational if, if the stronghold is not broken. Come on, church, just do with me today. Yeah. I understand where we're going with this, folks, but may you please, please listen to these warnings. So in verse 19, he continues, and I'm going to read that to you guys. Let's read this together. And in verse 19, he says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? When Paul, I don't know about you guys, again, remember we, we read scripture in paintings and pictures. And when I read this, I couldn't help but laugh because this is what Paul is saying. And this will, this will kind of appease some of you parents because I'm sure you've had this conversation before with your kids, especially once they become teenagers. Um, you have this, what Paul is saying is, what he means by do you not know, he's saying, listen, you think you know this? But you really don't, so you might want to pay attention to this next part because you think you know, but you really don't know, so here's the no. You still with me today, church? I know you've had that conversation. I've had that conversation with my dad when I thought I knew everything. It says, no, you, but Edgar, you got to listen. You, you, there, you don't know. You think you know, but you really don't know, so you might want to pay attention to this, Edgar. Well, that's what Paul's saying. You, you think you know, but listen, what I'm about to tell you is important. and It'll change the game. And he says, do you not know? And he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You know what that saying is? That you are the most sacred image. You're the most sacred thing than, than all the sacred things that exist in this world. Um. I got the, when I was right, putting this together, I got to thinking, I'm sorry, balcony people, I'm, I'm, I, I come up here for y'all. I got to thinking about places I've had the opportunity to visit in my life, and um, as far as sacred places, and maybe you guys have been there, but to me, and especially this weekend, I guess brought it out in me. If you guys ever been to, um, to D.C., our nation's capital, and ever been to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, has anybody ever, ever been there? and seeing the changing of the guard. And it, it, is, it is one of the most incredible moments we have ever seen. I mean, I'm standing there, and we're watching this, and it, it, it brings me to tears even now. Think about it now. It is the most incredible thing to be able to. It really is. It takes your breath away when you see that. And it's, it's sacred, and it's awesome, and it gets you right in your feels. To me, that's a sacred thing. I've had the, also the opportunity to travel in Europe and, and go to Italy and, and to walk in some of the basilicas and those cathedrals. And it, it literally, again, I've mentioned this before, it literally takes your breath away. I walked to the Sistine Chapel and um, walking in and out, don't have any pictures to show you because you're not allowed to have cameras in there, but I'm telling you, you walk in that place and you're constantly looking up and you're running into people because you're looking up the whole time um, because it takes your breath away. It is beautiful and it's sacred. And yet what Paul is saying to us, he's saying, listen, above all those things, you are more sacred than that. Why? Because you bear the image of God. Because you bear the image of God. Of God, Come on, church, you still with me today? You saying, why, um, why is that such a, a huge deal? Um, I'm going to use Lily. Come here, Lily. Come, Lily is my friend here. Come on, don't worry. I want, I want you to say anything. Come up here on the altar. Come turn around let them see your pretty face. This is my friend Lily. Can you want to say hi, Lily? 
Lily here is, um, hold on, let me do this because I don't make sure. Preachers always have bad breath. Not me, right? Um, I've known this precious little girl. We had this discussion just yesterday. Six days old, right? Less than a week old. Um, Pam and Ed, you guys were there. So we've known this little girl when she was less than a week old. I actually held her. I held her up like Simba. I did the whole song, Lion King. Nah, 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 nah. So I've known this girl since that time. And every time I look at her, it just melts my heart. Not because I think she's the most beautiful thing in the world, but this girl right here is, is an image bearer. When I see her, it, it's like you bear the image of God. And here's the question I have for us guys. In knowing that, this is where I mentioned earlier that this can change the entire game for us and even change culture. Stephanie almost touched on it a little bit this morning. In knowing that from one another, especially in a marriage or a dating relationship. So those of you who are married or could be married someday, so young people listen to this. If somehow Jesus tarries a little bit longer, um, that could be a bridge you can cross someday, okay? So you better pay attention to this. It'll change the way you treat one another. Okay, that fell on deaf ears. Knowing that can literally change how we treat one another when you look at someone or if you're looking at your spouse or you're looking at your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're looking at another human being, even if you're not in a dating relationship. I love you, sweet. Even if you're not in a dating relationship, knowing that the other human being that you are looking in the eyes into is in a sacred image bearer of God, how would that change the way you treat them? Let that soak in. I'm doing a, a, a dramatic pause on purpose so you guys can capture that. Because that was so convicting all over again for me this week. In the context of what Paul is addressing this morning, so when I look at Stephanie, knowing that she is an image bearer, she is a sacred image bearer, how would that change my approach and how I treat her, how I speak to her, how I respond to her? How did, now listen, I'm not saying I'm perfect. She might say that, but I know I'm not, okay? It's a totally joke. You guys are asleep this morning. But in knowing that, how would that change this dynamic as a married couple? It changes everything if you have that context of knowing that she carries the image of God. She is the image of God. So how will I treat my moral compass? What is that? What is, which way is that compass pointing knowing that I'm responsible to her? That's good. You still with me today, church? I'm telling you, it's not just I understand sexual immorality. We talk about that and we talk about that in relation to dating and marriage and all that. I get that. It's, and it's huge. But I, I think it even goes even deeper than that. This is what I meant by it'll change our entire culture today if everyone would to treat one another and we look at one another and, we, and I look at one of you guys going, but you bear the image of God. So how I'm going to respond to you right now will change everything. I've got to be aware of that. Come on, are you still with me today? This is why this can change the game. It can change our culture. And yes, it can be. Is our culture running out of control, crazy wild? Yes. But culture, again, guys, doesn't dictate my relationship with God. Are you still with me, church? I'm telling you, I'll say this again. This is, whew, this should be our source. There's going to be so many competing voices out there, even in church. And if, you're, if your spirit, your life, your relationship doesn't line up with this, you better get to know this because something can sound so awesome and it is way off track of what God's really trying to say. Remember, I've said this before, good is the enemy of best. What is the best thing that God's trying to speak into you and I today? It can be good, but good is the enemy of best. Is it the best? Is it exactly the truth on what God's trying to speak into you? Come on, church, stay with me. Today, this is, and not because of Edgar, it has nothing to do with him, I promise you. But this is the best word that God is speaking into you and I today. 
that 2,000 years later, Paul is looking and he's speaking to you and I today going, if you were to look at somebody as a sacred image bearer of God, how would you treat them? Would you think twice before entering into any kind of, any kind of sin? Do you guys sit with me today, church? Back in 2014, let me give you, let me put it to you another way. Maybe this will help some of you guys out. I'm not necessarily a musician, but I do have a drum now, so I could be dangerous. But in 2014, there was a Stratocaster guitar. For those of you who are musicians, that's a pretty big deal, okay? There was a Stratocaster guitar that normally those guitars retail for about $1,800, right? In my close station, somewhere around $1,800. In 2014, this particular guitar sold for over $45,000. You want to know why? There was a certain signature on that guitar. The signature was Eric Clapton. You probably don't know who he is, but those of you who might listen to that stuff, I listen to him. I, I get an incredible musician. Can do things with a guitar. It's awesome. What brought that value up? The owner of that particular item, the owner of the guitar says, that's my guitar, and the value of that guitar skyrocketed. Right. You guys still with me? He's saying, what does all that mean? <clears throat> Let me just read to you this way. The value of a container is determined by what it contains. That's why I picked on my friend Lily. Why is she so valuable? That in itself, is it valuable? What makes her val valuable is because of the, con the contents of what she contained inside, which is the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Guys, come on. I, I wish you can capture this. We are the temple. Because of the New Testament, this is the new covenant. Christ went on the cross. He says, now we're not bound to the old covenant anymore. You don't have to bring animals. You don't have to bring your cats. Bring your cat, cats to sacrifice a cat. You don't have to do all that anymore. Right. The new covenant says, when you come into my presence, I paid the price for that already. Amen. You still with me? So because of that new covenant, he says, listen, now you are the temple. This is a temple of worship. And I'm telling you guys, we will think twice of what we do with this thing when we really capture that, that I carry not only the image of God, but this is a temple of worship. So where am I taking this temple of worship? That's a whole other sermon for another day, but let that sink in for a little bit. That will make you think twice of where that little temple might be going someday. What are you putting inside that temple? What's that temple listening to? Well, it's the images that might be coming into that temple. Come on, church, stay with me. I mean, I can go all day on this. But as far as us, why, why is this? This is what Paul is saying. You are valuable. You are awesome. But why? Because you are the temple. And why is that so valuable? Because the content of that temple has God in it. The very presence of God. Go do study in Old Testament. When they carried the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the presence of God, you guys still remember? Do you all know that? Do, us, do the research on the Ark of the Covenant. It is powerful. Only certain people, the Levite priests, were the only ones allowed to touch it. So if I ever walk up and just grab the pole, if it's starting to fall off, I would die in an instant. You still, you still, that's how, come on. Put all that into you and I. We are now the temple of of the Holy Spirit, which contains the very presence of God. Folks, that is powerful. It'll change the way you pray, the way you worship, the way you read, the way you come into the presence of God. Why? Because we contain that. So in, relation, in relationships, how do we treat one another knowing that that person right there, my precious Lily right there, is a temple of the Holy Spirit? How will I treat her? How would I treat Stephanie? How would I treat Diana, Rachel, JP, Susan? Come on, guys. It goes, oh, no, no. How would I treat one? How would I treat that knowing that you carry the very presence of God? You are that temple. So good. And that's what Paul is saying, church. Come on, I'm telling you, this is a game changer. Our culture is desperately, desperately wanting for leadership to rise up. Make no mistake, I hope you're looking 
at what's happening. I know I don't watch the news very often either, but the little bits and pieces will somehow end up in my eyes and ears that I have seen. You know what I see? Because you can't look at it on surface level. Remember, there's always a root there. And what I'm seeing there is a nation, a people that are desperate for somebody to rise up that's different and true and good. It's all they want to see. So what are you showing them? What's your temple showing? When we compromise, and I touched on this last week, I'll, I'll bring it in a little bit here this week, but not a whole lot. But when we compromise this temple, and this temple ends up in places that are not of God, what signal are we showing? See, that's, that's old school preaching. I get it. I, I get it. Nobody wants to talk about righteousness and all that, but I'm telling you, folks, this is going to change the world now. It's not the words, not your Facebook post. It doesn't work like that. How are we going to change the world? When we figure out really quick, we are image bearer. Let me just move on, guys, because I can stay there forever. Verse 20. Verse 20 says, you are not, you're, anyway, let me go on. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Therefore honor God with your body. And I just touched on it. That's kind of what I was trying to say is what if you saw people the way God saw them? What if we realize that we are that temple? So to flee from sexual immorality, guys, it's going to take some guardrails. And I want to leave you with just some practical things, just three. It's all I wrote down. I'm sure there's many more I could go. But if you guys are able to take notes or just jot some things down, um, let me just give you some practical stuff here before we transition to communion. The um, first one is talk. Talk about it or tell them about it. Now, now I'm talking more on the marriage and dating relationship. So if you are married or could be married or looking into marriage possibly one day, um, for the UTN, I'm telling you guys, it's going to come faster than you think, okay? Talk about it. Talk about those things with your significant other. And let me give you a little hint on this, guys. Listen, this is for going to get real, okay? Um, if you have a hesitation about that conversation that you're going to have with your spouse, that's a guardrail. Catch that? If there's even a little bit of hesitation, let's just say I were to sit down with Stephanie and we're going to talk about, as a married couple, we're going to sit down and talk about guardrails in our life. What are some things, Stephanie, that you and I are not going to compromise on? And if there's some things that maybe you and I need to stay away from. What are those things? What does that look like? Guys, if you never talk about this with your spouse, then all you're going to do is end up in a guessing game, and that's why they always have constant, not fighting, but really passionate discussions, okay? I'm just trying to help you guys out. Listen, I'm not the expert. I'm sure not a pro with this because I still fail miserably. But, man, talking about it and telling each other about it is huge. And, I have, and if I have a hesitation... And saying something or bringing something up for fear of retaliation, and that should be a guardrail for you. That's a red flag. That's a good thing. Remember, the whole point of guardrails is to light up your consciousness, to light up something and say, listen, you, sh- you don't have to hit the guardrail. It's there to keep you from danger, but it's also there to light something up going, hello, 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 there's danger there. Get away from that. Don't go there. Don't talk to that. Don't get caught in that. Come on, are you still with me? Yeah. If you've ever, and this is one of the things, and I know I'm glad we have some deacons here this morning. One of the things that I love and fell in love with this church right from the very beginning as a pastor, from a pastor's perspective, is that our boardroom is full of windows. Complete transparency. Nothing to hide. You get that, folks? That's how I treat things in my office. If I'm going to counsel or sit with somebody and talk, especially somebody from the opposite sex. I want to make sure that Tanya or and or Derwin or somebody is there because there's accountability there. Come on, church. This is what I'm talking about, things that we talk about. Stephanie and I talked about that. In ministry, there's things I'm not going to compromise on and do, and we've talked those things through, so she knows already. There's some guardrails I'm going to put in my life that's just not going to happen. When we were in student ministry, I never took a kid home. Especially a girl. That's definitely not going to happen. You think, what's the harm in that? Are you going to do anything? No. I don't plan on doing anything. I'm sure not going to do anything. But listen, guys, the appearance of that can damage both of us. And it's over. 
I, again, this is very, very practical. This might not seem like spiritual preaching to you guys, but it is real stuff that people mess up on all the time. And we're living in a very sue-happy people right now. And all it takes is just someone's word, and your life is ruined because you didn't think things through. Those guardrails. So yeah, this is some practical preaching that your pastor is not, not a weenie about not preaching about. You're going to hear it from me. It needs to be talked about in church. Because it seems like more, more times than not, I'm always, ta- I'm always talking about that somebody who's already made the, made the decision is already in jail. I'm not saying it's too late. That person's life definitely is redeemed. In fact, I just got another letter on my desk. From my buddy is in prison right now. Awesome what God's doing in this life. But it's hard in church. I'm trying to help you guys out and girls out. Can you say amen? amen? Thank you, Lily. Two. Kind of staying on the same lines. Talk or tell somebody. You're saying, what do you mean by that? Um, Same-sex accountability is huge. Now, there's, there's an accountability that comes automatically with a husband and wife. I understand all that. But there's things that I just cannot discuss with Stephanie. It doesn't mean I'm hiding anything from her. But I can't talk about guy stuff with Stephanie because she just don't get it because she ain't no guy. Okay? I understand all that? That's a whole other sermon for another day. But, I mean, this, yeah, this is a biblical definition of marriage here, and she ain't a guy. Okay? I am. She ain't. So I'm not going to talk to her about certain things. So I have put in place some pastor friends of mine. Good. And I've got one represented in every part of this northeast region on purpose. Got a friend over in Tyler. Got a friend in Sulphur Springs. Got a friend over in the Texarkana, Atlanta area. And we all meet together and we talk things out. You know one of them, by the way. And we talk things out and we coach each other and we talk about and we ask very difficult questions from one another. Why? Because we're trying to sharpen each other and keep each other from harm. That's good. That's good. That's hard sometimes. Because there's sometimes I'll get a text from one of those guys, and it's timely because it's almost like, oh, man, how did he know? Well, the Holy Spirit told him. And I'll get a text from a question about a question, and it's timely, and that question's very challenging, and I answer it in the only way I know how because he's my accountability. Are you still with me, church? For you men and women out there, and even students, okay, um, get some accountability in your life. I just started that with some young men. Now we meet on Tuesday mornings. They came to me and saying, Pastor, lead us in a Bible devotion. Lead us in accountability because we need that in our life. You think I'm going to say no to that? I love it. So men and women, find somebody. Listen, and this is, I know this is going to sound really rudimentary and, and simple, but... Don't let it be, guys, a girl shouldn't be your best friend, shouldn't be your accountability. That's right. That's I, I've counseled too many and many times where the guy's like, oh, she's my best friend. How's your wife think about that one? Oh, she's okay with it. No, I'm telling you, she's not. She's lying to you. <laughs> she is lying to you. I'm just, guys, is this practical stuff that you guys can chew on? Come on, this is good stuff. So same sense of accountability. Talk or tell somebody. And the last one, you guys come on up, the worship team. Social media pitfalls. I'm not going to preach. I can preach an hour on social media. Um, but I'm not talking about Facebook. That's not kind of what I'm talking about. The problem with social media, when it comes to relationships, guys, here's the problem with that. There's no limits on where and how you're, where you can go on that and what you can say. There's no limits. You can pretend to be anybody you want. You can talk to and cross so many moral lines that are there because all you're doing is it, you, I'm just sitting behind a, a television screen or a computer screen. There's no, there's no harm in that. There's huge amount of harm in that. Come on, are you still with me? Watch that. I, I, I mean, I, I think that's common sense, but it's really not. So it's worth repeating to you guys and telling you as a pastor, man, put up guardrails in your life. Um, even on computers, Man, there, there is some software and some measures you can take to really protect yourself. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, if that's ever been a problem in your life, tell somebody and then put up those guardrails so you don't fall into those pitfalls. And then you start talking to somebody. You're saying, well, it's all on a computer, but then there's always something more. Yep. It never stops at that. Right. So I, can I just throw that out there, guys? Just um, as I mentioned, guardrails are what? The whole point of guardrails it's the light of your consciousness. 
If there's a red flag happening, then pay attention to the red flag. Are you with me, church? Yep. I, I realize this is <laughs> a Fourth of July weekend. You're probably expecting something about freedom, but there really is so much freedom in this. Yep. So I guess it is a message about freedom. Because if we don't understand stuff like this, if we don't practice these things and put up guardrails in our life, then folks, I'm telling you, then you're living a non-free life. And you're bound. There's so much freedom that, I mean, people say it all the time, I don't know how you guys can have fun by doing this, or how do you have fun living that way? Or how do you have fun with being accountable to each other like that? I, I'll be honest with you, we have, we have a lot of fun that way. We really do. Now, Stephanie and I are not perfect. I know I'm all funny in this society. I get all that. We've had our issues through the years. But we've learned a thing or two. <laughs> we've learned a thing or two. We've served under pastors who didn't take care of it. And that, I mean, that was a huge eye-opener uh, I mean, eye to me. I'm sorry about stumbling through my words, but that, what I'm about to say, I, I don't say it quite often, but we've worked for pastors who have failed morally. And I'm telling you guys, my eyes got that big and our heart broke into a million pieces. And I'm going, oh God, I hope it's never me. Is that redeemable? Yes. Is it forgivable? Yes. Can God put back together? Yes, he can. I don't know who I'm talking here this morning, whether you're here in person or at home, watching online. This is such an important topic to preach on right now because it has everything to do with righteousness. Are we made righteous because of ourselves? No. God is the only one that makes us righteous. This is why this is so important. Can we just listen to these words today? You think it doesn't really apply to me. I get it. But you can turn around and share these words with somebody who may be struggling in this area. But it really does apply to many people in this place. It applies to me and Stephanie. Because I want those guardrails up. I want to be a pastor you're proud of. Not because I'm all that in a bag of chips. Because I follow the Holy Spirit. I'm led by Him. And I put those guardrails up for a reason. So that's just, that's just my challenge to you guys today. Can you stand to your feet today, church? Our ushers are about to take their places for communion. While those guys are taking their spots and their places, I want to, um, I, like, I invite you just to shut everything else out right now. If you can, guys, just, just close your eyes and just, just to shut out distractions, to shut out just whatever might keep you from hearing what the Holy Spirit wants to speak into you right now. Before we transition into a time of communion, uh, this is the question, the challenge I have for all of us. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've fallen. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've experienced that. I, I really don't need to know all that this morning. I, I really, I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands because I think all of us, all of us can, can grab on to this message today. Every single one of us are an image bearer of God and every single one of us are a temple of the Holy Spirit. My challenge to you today, church, is capture that today. Get that so deep into your heart so that we treat one another with love. Put those guardrails up in friendships, but also put up those guardrails today morally. Ask yourself or have somebody ask you those tough questions. And have your life changed this morning from the inside out. Right now, I just want to pray for everybody. If you're here this morning and maybe you need prayer this morning, you can just pray that over yourself as I'm praying over you. But let's just seek the Holy Spirit right now. Father in heaven, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you for the tough messages you're asking us to preach today, Lord. You're asking me to bring. In this day and age that we are living in, Lord, and I feel, and many feel the same way in their spirit, Lord God, this day and age we're living in is drawing to an end, Lord. And you're coming back. Scripture is very specific. You're coming back for people who are looking for your return. And looking for your return, what does that look like? Those are people who are not perfect, 
Lord, you're, you're, you're looking for a people who are walking in your footsteps. And yes, they may stumble, and yes, they may fall, but your hand is always there to pick us right back up. Dust off that, that dirt and the grime and the junk off our lives, and you put us right back on the path, Lord God. Just like we do with our own kids. Lord, we don't leave our kids just laying there like a slug. We pick them up. We dust them off. We love on them, Lord, and we put them right back on the path and right back to where they were going, Lord. That's the challenge today, Lord. It's not a message of judgment, Lord. It's a message of using wise judgment. Challenge us to put those guardrails in our life, God. So that we can walk closely in your footsteps, Father. Jesus, we pray all this in your name and everybody says amen. Let me give you a little bit of direction of where we're going these next few moments. And if you're at home, hopefully you made the preparations in your homes to, um, to join us in communion this morning. Um, first of all, this is open to anybody. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake in communion here in this experience. You don't have to be. The only requirement I, I want to make this clear is it's just a personal one between you and God. If you feel like you're worthy enough, and I say, are we ever worthy? No. But spiritually, if you think you're ready enough to be able to partake in communion, and please, by all means, participate. I love you too. So I'll make sure everybody understands that. Our ushers are going to dismiss you by sections. We only have a couple here, guys, so we're going to do the intersection, the outer section, or however you guys plan on doing that. Our, our, our things are a little bit different. Let me take one for an example. In case you haven't been here since the last communion, we're trying to do our best and practicing the safety measures in the day and age we're living in. So you've got a pre-packaged little deal here, guys, okay? Just peel that top layer off, and you guys can follow the rest. The little wafer sits up on top, and the juice cup is right underneath that. So be careful, because you could spill it all over yourself. Um, I am notorious for that, and so uh, I'm going to try to be careful. Um, but anyway, that's, this is what we have this morning. So I ushers to go ahead. You guys go ahead and um, dismiss them by however you want to do that. Take the emblems, guys. Take them back to your seats, and we'll take them together, okay?
Thank you, Lord. If you were to receive your emblems, I know some are still being served. Go ahead and start peeling off that top layer so you guys can get to the wafer. I realize this is totally different than what we're used to, but that's where we are for today. I appreciate you guys in that. Thank you, Lord. Is there any chance that um, every chance that I get to celebrate around the Lord's table, it's always something special for me. I don't ever want to take that for granted. And I hope you guys don't either. Guys, this is such a special moment. And every time I think about even leading up to it, to this moment right now, I always try to put myself in what, what were they thinking during that moment? What was Jesus thinking while he was sitting at the table and reclining with these guys? And these are the men that he gave his life for. The last three and a half years, he walked with these guys and he cried with them and he laughed with them and saw miracles with them and they saw tragedy and death and, and it's so much. He, he did life with these guys. And he knows exactly what's about to happen and he's trying his best to tell these guys, listen, guys, I, I'm, about to, I'm about to fulfill my purpose on why I'm here. And they still didn't get it. They still didn't get it. And I, he said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, I'm about to fulfill my purpose. I'm about to go through some things that are going to upset you and flip your world upside down. But it's for a reason, and you're not going to be left alone. You guys remember that, right? I'm going to leave you somebody who's going to stay with you until the end of the day now. And his name is it's the Holy Spirit. But this has to happen. I, I just can't imagine... The, the emotion, the raw emotion that was around that table when they're standing around or sitting and they're listening to these words and like, but we've seen you raise people from the dead. We've seen what you can do. We've seen you go into a temple and flip everybody's table. I mean, we've seen what you can do, Jesus. This, what you're saying makes no sense to us. And of course, he's like, well, you'll see for these next few days how things are going to change. And you guys, listen, this is where you and I come in. Because he's looking at you and I in the same manner. You guys are going to change the world. This is, so when I celebrate around the Lord's table, yes, I remember the sacrifice. I remember everything that Jesus put into that. So that you and I have the opportunity to have life. But the other part of that is he's looking at a group of people and he's telling them, you guys are the ones who are going to change this world. It's not going to be me in the physical sense. I'm using you. You guys are going to do it. So he's looking at you and I this morning as you guys hold the emblems in your hand, just hold the bread together. He's looking at you and I and says, you have the greatest story ever told. And not only that, you are an image bearer. And I, I'm looking at every single one of you guys in the eyeball. I hope I'm catching everybody here and at home. I love you, church, more than I can ever convey to you. And I see you as Immerberge. I, I, I see you as a world changer. Because that's how Christ sees us. So as we hold the representation of Christ's body in our hands, let us remember, yes, this cost someone his life. It cost him dearly. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he still did it for you and I today. Isn't that incredible? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son to begin with. That, that in itself was hard. But Abba, Father, you sat back and watched as this world tore your son to pieces. This world hurt your son, God. I'm a father, God. I, I, I don't know how you did it. You sat back and watched your son fulfilled his purpose, and it was a gruesome, gruesome purpose. So Jesus, thank you for paying the price, for paying the price so that we can celebrate freedom here today. So Jesus, we thank you. In your name we pray.
Amen. Would you take the bread with me? You guys can hold the res representation of Christ's blood in that cup. Thank you, Lord. Church, this cup represents something so huge. It's not just the salvation, and that in itself is an incredible miracle. It's also a cup of joy. It's a cup of healing today. I'm going to pray specifically that bodies and minds and relationships and that people are healed this morning. I'm praying that people will walk out of this experience today because they were healed in a communion service. That's how you know it's God. It has nothing to do with this preacher. It has everything to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you again for your sacrifice. Jesus, thank you for what you chose to do just for me, for us. And that blood is still giving today. That blood purchased for us a salvation. This blood also purchased for us a healing today, Jesus. I pray that right now in this instant, Lord, as we celebrate by taking the cup together, Lord, in these next few moments, Lord, that, Father, Lord, instant healing, that healing begins to happen, Lord. That people walk out of this place, Lord God, and this experience and their testimony is, man, I was healed in a communion service. Because that's how powerful of a Savior we serve. So Jesus, our prayer right now, Lord, is that you would heal bodies, heal minds, heal spirits, heal relationships, heal emotions today, Lord. Would you bring healing in this place today, Jesus? In your name we pray. And everybody says... Amen. Through faith, will you take this cup with me today? Thank you, Lord.